Let's say you come across this word. You're a fluent English speaker, but you've never seen it before. How would you pronounce it? Agusha? Aguizia? Aguasha? Because English borrows words from so many different languages, it's impossible to know the pronunciation of a word the first time you see it. And maybe that's why America has the National Spelling Bee, a celebration of the insane irregularity of English spelling. English uses the Latin alphabet, which is shared amongst over 3,000 languages. But the alphabet's spelling to sound consistency varies greatly among those languages. Finnish is almost perfectly consistent, with Italian falling close behind. On the other end of the spectrum, French and English are full of irregularities. That means your E may be completely different from a French person's E and a Finnish person's E. It can be confusing, even frustrating when you're trying to communicate with each other. Now imagine a global alphabet, one that could transcend countries and languages, capturing sounds in a simple and efficient way. The perfect alphabet may be closer than you think, and it comes from a country that we're more familiar with now than ever before. For those of you interested in East Asian languages, I'm sure you've heard of Korean's writing system. Hangul. Hangul was famously created by King Sejong of the Joseon Dynasty in the 1440s. Now, before Hangul, Korean was written using Chinese characters. So King Sejong created Hangul to help the average person learn to read and write. The Hangul system, which has individual letters for consonants and vowels, is alphabetic. Its consonants are based on five basic shapes that a human speech organs make while producing those sounds. Adding a stroke turns a consonant into its aspirated form, and doubling it makes it tense, or fortis. It's an intuitive system that connects related sounds to related shapes. However, it differs from purely alphabetic systems like the Latin alphabet, in which each letter stands alone in a linear sequence. In Hangul, each letter, or kurja, is written as a syllabic block that contains one consonant and one vowel. Even if a syllable doesn't start with a consonant, a placeholder consonant is written to complete the block. Many Korean speakers consider Hangul to be one of the easiest writing systems to learn. In spoken Korean, the letters retain their original pronunciation most of the time, and when changes do happen, they're predictable based on sound assimilation rules. Now, this sounds great, doesn't it? We can clearly see where a syllable starts and where it ends. We can predict how almost any word will sound, and there are only 25 symbols to learn. Hangul seems like the perfect writing system, but there's just one major problem. If it's so great, why is it only used for Korean? Well, it may seem obvious. Hangul was designed for the Korean language, and its letters represent Korean sounds, not sounds found in other languages, least of all, English. For example, there is a common joke among expats living in Korea. Because Korean doesn't have F, V, or Z, it's hard to know if passion means fashion or passion, whether petty is berry or very, or whether pork is pork or fork. Additionally, modern Korean doesn't have consonant clusters. It follows the C, V, C syllable structure. So foreign words with clusters are broken down into multiple syllables. For example, the English word Spain is one syllable, but in Korean, it's three. S -p -in. S -p -in. With all this in mind, it may seem obvious that Hangul is not well suited for English or most other languages. But did you know, Hangul originally had a whole other set of letters designed to transcribe sounds in foreign languages, such as Chinese and even English? <laughs> So, I usually don't share too much about my personal life on this channel. You guys know that I did my Chinese linguistics in my PhD and my master's, but did you also know that I'm a board game designer? That's right, when I'm not busy poring over old Chinese documents and academic journals, I'm playing board games. But just playing board games wasn't enough for me. I decided I also wanted to design them. So during the height of the pandemic, I designed my first game, Cake Off. 
Cake Off is all about making desserts. At the start of the game, you're a dealt three recipe cards, and each recipe card has three ingredients you have to collect. The best part of the game is the interaction. We have action cards that allow you to sabotage other people's recipes, steal recipes from them, and even freeze or burn their completed recipes. The first player to complete recipes, totaling five stars, five star chef, wins. I created this game as a love letter to desserts from around the world. You guys know I love languages and I also love the cultures associated with those languages. There are recipes from over 24 countries in this tiny little box and I'll bet your bottom dollar you haven't heard of all of them. The game is now available on Amazon. The link is in the bio and at under $20 this just might be the best stocking stuffer money can buy. And now back to the video. To understand this, we have to go back to the 1400s and look at the atmosphere on the Korean Peninsula. At that time, Korea was part of the Sinosphere, a cultural world centered around China. Korea was a tributary state, regularly sending tributes to China in exchange for political legitimacy, cultural exchange, and trade opportunities. But King Sejong's creation of Hangul was seen as a bold step outside of that long-established China-Korea relationship. You see, Korea had long modeled its writing system, its Confucian policies, among others, based on China's example. By creating a completely new writing system, independent of Chinese characters, King Sejong was challenging the status quo in a big, big way. And this caused a lot of resistance and contempt from a lot of court leaders at the time. Consider this now famous passage in which King Sejong introduces Hangul. The language of our nation differs from that of China, so Chinese characters do not suit it. Because of this, ordinary people often cannot express what they truly wish to say. Out of compassion, I have created 28 new letters so that everyone may learn them easily and use them in daily life. We can see here that King Sejong created 28 new letters. But modern Korean only has 25. So what happened to the other three? Actually, if we want to be specific, there are four letters originally created by King Sejong that are no longer being used today. They are the vowel, are a. Are a is estimated to be this IPA sound, which is the vowel found in many English words, such as cup, some, love, etc. And three consonants, panchim. Panchim is said to be very close to a Z sound, which is useful for Mandarin, English, and many Indo-European and Slavic languages. Yorin hiot. Yorin hiot is estimated to be a glottal stop, which can be seen in English's uh-oh and other languages. And finally, yet ying. Yet ying is the ng sound, which is found at the beginning of a syllable. This sound originally existed in Middle Chinese, but now only exists in certain Chinese varieties, such as Sichuanese, Cantonese, Hakka, and Min. This sound is also found in many Austronesian languages and African languages. Over time, due to sound changes in Korean, these letters eventually fell out of use. But that's not the full story. King Sejong, sensing opposition from Confucian leaders in his court, went a step further he additionally created a whole other set of letters that could transcribe Chinese sounds, not just Korean ones. This is a comprehensive look at all the sounds that existed around the creation of Hangul. In addition to the three lost consonants I mentioned earlier, King Sejong also created other letters to transcribe Chinese initials. Kabyon Piop, estimated to be this IPA sound, an allophone of the English V sound. Kabyon Piop, estimated to be F. Kabyon Miyom, estimated to be W. Because Middle Chinese was a tonal language, King Sejong also added tone diacritics to Hangul. But because the tones in Middle Chinese were very different than they are now, let's just take a quick look at what they were back then. The four tones back in Middle Chinese were Ping, Shang, Qu, and Ru. Ping was a flat level tone, Shang was a rising tone, Qu was a falling tone, and Ru was called the entering tone, 
This only occurred on syllables ending in P, T, or K, and this was not a phonemically contrasting tone because it only existed on these syllables. King Sejong system called pangjum or side dots were based on the Middle Chinese four tones, but in actuality, the tones they represented were quite different. They most likely reflect Korean tones and not Chinese tones. So at the time, if a Korean syllable had a low tone, it got no side dots. An example would be the Korean word hwal, hwal, which means bow or arc. If a syllable had a high tone, it got one left side dot. This can be seen in kal, kal, which means knife or sword. If a syllable had a rising tone, it got two left side dots. An example would be the word tol, tol, which means stone. These tone markers obviously don't represent Mandarin tones now, nor do they represent Korean tones because Korean doesn't use tones anymore. But many African languages only differentiate tone between high flat and low flat. So these dots could be really helpful. And you know, for Asia, we already have a rising tone with the two dots. We could have a falling tone with the two dots on the left side of the syllable, right? These are all workable possibilities if we wanted to use the side dots in a greater sense. So these side dots are really interesting because they show that Korean originally did have tones, but because they weren't essential to meaning, they eventually died out. Now, this all sounds great, but there is still one huge piece of the puzzle missing if Hunger wants to be a global alphabet. Uh, we're forgetting the fact that Korean doesn't have consonant clusters, which is a huge problem when foreign words are trying to translate into hunger. They, they look a bit weird. Um, but here's the thing, guys. Korean used to have consonant clusters. When hunger was created in the 1400s, Korean had tons of consonant clusters. In fact, some of the consonant clusters in Korean were ones that English doesn't even have. For example, there were clusters starting with S, SP, ST, SK, clusters that began with P, PT, PTH, PS, PC, clusters that begin with PS, PST, PSK. Over time, many of these consonant clusters turn into double consonants, which is why we don't see them anymore. So to summarize, not only does Hangul have the ability to transcribe and represent a whole set of sounds more than we originally thought it could, it also has a tone marking system and last but not least, it has a precedent and a method for dealing with consonant clusters. Honestly, the more you look at it, the more it seems like Hangul is becoming a great, great candidate for the global alphabet. Of course, this has all just been an elaborate thought experiment. Hangul is tightly tied to Korean, the language it was designed for. And although linguists say it's the most intuitive or scientific writing system ever made, in reality, it's only used by people who speak Korean. Or is it? In 2009, a small community in Indonesia decided to adopt Hangul to write their local language, Jaja. You see, Indonesia is incredibly linguistically diverse with over 700 different languages, many of which don't have a written form. The residents of Baobao, located in southern Indonesia, were worried that without a writing system, their language would just go extinct. The official language of Indonesia is Bahasa Indonesia, which uses the Latin alphabet. But the people of Baobao felt like the Latin alphabet couldn't really capture the sounds of Jaja, so they turned to Hangul. I think it's Hangul's intuitive and logical design that allowed a community thousands of miles away, with no political or cultural ties to Korea, to adopt it as their writing system. In fact, the really cool thing is, is that the residents of Baobao are using some of the lost letters of Hangul I mentioned earlier to write their own language, which is different, obviously, from Korean. For example, they decided to bring back Kabyeon Pyeop for V sounds and Sangliul for L sounds. They've even created some new letters based on Hangul's logic to capture sounds unique to their language. <laughs> 
Hangul was assigned for Korean, there's no doubt about that. But King Sejong himself proposed that new letters could be created based on the principles behind Hangul. This shows us from the very beginning that it had the ability and the potential to go global. And we've seen it happen with the people of Baobao. So I wanted to share a really funny personal story that really just ties all of this together. So I live in Korea and I have a French friend here and we both speak Korean. So I was texting her and I was saying, I think it's such a crime that in America they call Hyundai, you know, the big company in America, Hyundai. Uh, I was writing, you know, the Korean letters, Hyundai. And she said, well, it's better than in France where we call him Hyundai. And obviously, you know, in France, they don't pronounce the H at the beginning of a word. And I just thought it was hilarious that we actually communicated these sounds better using Hangul rather than the Latin alphabet because, you know, English and French uses the Latin alphabet differently. They have different sounds. So it just made me realize Hangul is actually such a unique and special writing system and that I'm really, really thankful for it. Um, and coincidentally, Hangul Day, Hangul art is actually, was actually coming up. Uh, it's today as I'm recording this. Uh, I don't know if I can get this out today, but we'll see. Um, and uh, yeah, so I know I usually make videos about Chinese, but Korean is also very close to my heart. And Hangul, I find no personal bias here. I think it's the best alphabetic system. Uh, so I really hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something new and I will see you next time.